This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Oh, hi there. When it comes to media preservation, there is really nothing more overlooked than commercials. In the effort to fill hard drives with movies and TV shows, commercials are almost always cut out. And unless someone's around to record commercials off the TV or download them off YouTube, once they're gone, you're not gonna find them on streaming. In this video, we're gonna cover lost commercials of all kinds. Some of the earliest ever made, creepy lost PSAs, local ads, some absurd Donkey Kong bumpers, and some more recent ads that just slipped through the cracks. Here is Lost Commercials, Volume 2. The first commercial ever made. Given that commercials in general are overlooked when preserving media, it's no surprise that the very first commercial ever made has been lost. But just like with many other firsts, it's hard to pin down the definitive answer. But the consensus seems to be that the 1896 ad for the British match manufacturer Bryant & May, created by film pioneer Burt Akers, was the very first commercial ever made. 1896 was a big year for Burt Akers. In the years prior, he invented the first 35mm film camera in Britain that also served as its own projector, in contrast to Edison's kinetoscope, where films could only be viewed one at a time through a peephole. His inventions would lead to his 1895 film, Incident at Cloverly Cottage, a film that was hailed as the first successful motion picture film made in Britain. The movie is now lost, but its success put Akers on the map, and in 1896, he would hold the first film screenings in the UK, direct more films, receive commissions, and get offers to buy his new technology. One such group interested in Akers' camera was the German chocolate manufacturer Stolwerk. They would eventually decide on purchasing the rights to the film devices of the Lumiere brothers over Acres camera and become one of the leading manufacturers of movie cameras in their time. Even though the deal didn't work out for Acres, through his dealings with Stolwerk, Acres would get in touch with the business partner of Stolwerks, Bryant and Mays, who would commission Acres to make a film promoting their brand of matches. This film is believed to be the world's first commercial. And yes, this is the same Bryant and Mays that ran sweatshops, would find their employees for mistakes, and gave workers what's called Fosse Jaw. The film consists of a man writing on a blackboard, Bryant and Mays matches are the best, before turning around, striking a match, and lighting a pipe. Though other publications claim that it said something different, something more long-winded like support home industries, Bryant and May matches are manufactured only at Fairfield Works, London. The commercial debuted in August 1896 at a screening of Acres movies at the Queen's Hall. Now, I do have to mention that it is debatable whether or not this is the first commercial. The only other real contender is the Lumiere Brothers' 1896 short film Washerwoman that prominently features product placement from the UK brand Lever Brothers. But most seem to agree that this is a case of product placement. Though a form of advertisement, the movie was not made with the express intent to promote the soap brands that appear on screen. We have the entirety of the Lumiere Brothers film, but not a single frame from Burt Akers' commercial for Bryant and May's matches. Burt Akers today is an often overlooked figure in early cinema, partially due to a 1912 book, Moving Pictures, that documented the history of early film. Much of the information in the book was sourced from Robert W. Paul, Akers' former business partner, who downplayed Akers' involvement in film history. It wasn't until the 70s that Burt Akers began to be recognized for his contribution to film. The fact that Akers was so overlooked in his time is likely the reason most of his works are lost, including his commercial for Bryant and May's Matches, the very first commercial ever made. She doesn't want myrrh, she wants tuna. Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever is a Lifetime original TV movie released on November 29th, 2014, about the titular internet celebrity Tartar Sauce, better known as Grumpy Cat voiced by Aubrey Plaza. And despite the best possible voice casting, the movie is bad. The AV Club said, the largest turd in Lifetime's crap crown of original programming. So unforgiving, so psychologically trying, that the process alone leaves the viewer straining to hear the dialogue over the sound of the soul being crushed wholesale. Bone and sinew <laughs> wrenched apart at the joint. So I remind you, this is a movie about a cat. And even a positive review by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch called the movie terrible. To promote Grumpy Cat's worst Christmas ever, a series of Christmas-themed ads were made with both Grumpy Cat and Aubrey Plaza. 
Aubrey Plaza and Grumpy Cat drink eggnog. Aubrey Plaza names the Meowsaya. Aubrey Plaza swats a Santa hat. Aubrey Plaza sings with Grumpy Cat. And Grumpy Cat Sushi, which might not have Aubrey Plaza in it. Even though the commercial has garnered a decent amount of buzz, and the ads were reported on by a few news and gossip sites, all links to the actual commercial have been privatized. The only commercial we currently have access to is the Meow Saya through the Wayback Machine. All the other videos are privated, but we can still see their thumbnails. I was able to come across a re-upload of Aubrey Plaza and Grumpy Cat Drink Eggnog, so that leaves three of Grumpy Cat's worst Christmas ever commercials lost. Sadly, as you may know, Tartar Sauce died of a urinary tract infection in 2019 at the age of 7, but will outlive us all, immortalized as the most famous and recognizable cat in the world. The first commercial in Japan. Even though the first commercials ever made were emerging in the late 1800s, we wouldn't see TV commercials until the mid-1900s, eventually making their way to Japan in 1953. After a few days of testing, on August 28, 1953, Nippon TV became the first commercial broadcaster in the entire continent. At 11.20, they kicked things off with a live opening ceremony, followed by a traditional dance, Kotobuki Shiki Sambaso, at 11.50, and at exactly 11.59 and 30 seconds, it was time for the main attraction. The entire reason Nippon TV became Asia's first commercial broadcaster, to broadcast commercials. And what better way to mark the occasion than with a clock, a clock by Kei Hattori, known today as Seiko, who aired a 30 second commercial ending right at noon. The ad ran like clockwork, but the commercial was set to 6 o'clock. They had it on M for Mini when it should have been on W for Wombo. The commercial played backwards. Now there are some inaccuracies about the commercial that have been spread by Seiko themselves. They claimed that the commercial aired at 7pm, but this was actually their second commercial. Seiko's official statement is that the original commercial at noon was upside down and cut off after 3 seconds of airtime. But this is debated by station insiders present at the airing who all claim that the ad played in its entirety. This idea that the commercial only aired for 3 seconds can be sourced back to a 1961 claim by Seiko's then advertising manager. The first one turned out to be a disaster. The film was broadcast upside down. I gasped. The person in charge must have been surprised when the title Seiko appeared on the screen. The film broadcasting stopped. It lasted less than three seconds. Given that the first claim that this commercial was cut short came eight years after it aired, and those who were present at the time say the ad played in its entirety, it's widely held that the commercial did air for a full 30 seconds upside down. In 1963, for Nippon TV's 10-year anniversary, the station held a special commemorating the occasion where they showed off some of the network's earliest programming, including the very first commercial ever aired in the country. Everything went great and it was well received, but for some reason after the special, the staff destroyed everything, including the Seiko commercials. To this day, it's still unknown why they did this. Only four stills from this commercial exist today, from the 1978 book 25 Year History of Commercials that also includes a transcript of the ad. A watch rotates 5 times per second, or 432,000 times during the day and night. It should be disassembled and cleaned at least once a year. The Seiko Shot Clock announces noon. Now I do have to clarify there is another possible candidate for the first commercial in Japan. Kotobuki Shiki Sambaso, the program that aired right before the Seiko commercial, was sponsored by Toshiba, meaning that there is a possibility that some kind of advertisement was present. But just like the case of the very first commercial in the world, we know product placement doesn't count and there's no evidence that Toshiba was mentioned as part of the program. And just like all the early programming from Nippon TV, the footage has been lost. And it appears that the Seiko commercial is the first commercial to ever air in Japan. The Mystery Fun House Commercials Mystery Fun House was an amusement complex in Orlando, Florida, running from 1976 to 2001. It was originally a 15-chamber park with a mirror maze, crooked room, crawling tunnels, a movie theater, hologram room, and more, before expanding to include laser tag, an arcade, dino-themed mini golf, a magic shop, and a Chuck E. Cheese-esque pizza parlor and animatronic show. It was pretty popular in its day. The movie Parenthood and Night Terror were partially filmed at the park. Mystery Funhouse began airing commercials in 1977 in the central Florida area. We only have a few images of these early commercials, and they're pretty terrifying. One of the child actors in the commercial, Tracy B, contacted Scott Jensen, the founder of Big Florida Country, a website dedicated to Florida theme parks, who then posted the message to the Big Florida Country page. 
Scott, here are the pictures that I told you about. The first one is of the wizard, which is how the commercial started. The one with me and my sister were taken in the disco room. Not the best quality, but not bad considering the pictures were taken right off the television as the commercial was airing. My dad would call the television stations in advance so that he knew exactly when the commercial was scheduled to air so that he can get his camera ready. It sounds like Tracy does not have a copy of the commercial and never did, only some still images that were taken when it aired. If someone does have a copy, they are yet to come forward. In 2022, after being closed for 20 years, Mystery Funhouse was torn down to make way for condos. DK TV In the late 90s, there was a strange TV show called Donkey Kong Country based on the video game franchise. It was actually the first cartoon to ever use motion capture for its characters. But there might have been a reason why no one else was doing it. The animation is rough. Despite this, the show was successful and was even referenced in future games, like the Crystal Coconuts that debuted in the show will later appear in the game Donkey Kong 64. But before it was a TV show, it was a French programming block called Le Planète de Donkey Kong, or The Planet of Donkey Kong, or just Donkey Kong Planet. The block aired in France from September 1996 to September 2021 on the TV channel France 2. It showed various children's programs like Arthur, Keenan and Kel, the Beetlejuice cartoon, Sister Sister, etc. And interspersed between shows was Donkey Kong Planet that featured original material with the DK crew. <laughs> Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong, Candy, Funky Kong, and Crush the Kremlin. Unlike the animated series it would eventually spin off to, Donkey Kong Planet used a live-action hybrid hosted by actress Melanie Angelie and Donkey Kong, who was superimposed over the live-action footage. But the shorts had a much smaller budget than the TV show. They each used a different voice cast, and the shorts would reuse character models for multiple different characters in the same skit, just being recolored or reskinned. Most of the shorts involved Donkey Kong misunderstanding human customs and just being an idiot in general. Melanie left the show in 2000, and it would eventually become rebranded as DKTV, among other names like DKTV.cool, DKTV Cool, or just Donkey Kong Planet. Today, about 40 minutes of the show has been preserved, but it ran for five years with new content frequently being produced. We know there's more to find, but we don't know how much. The Last Guy Everywhere The Last Guy is a forgotten gem of the PS3 era, in the game, the player controls the titular Last Guy, who needs to evacuate citizens from a city being overrun by monsters and zombies, who you have to avoid while everyone you rescued follows you to a safe point. The game is played in a Google Maps style top-down perspective of a city, allowing for 12 playable cities rendered using real satellite imagery. The more people you save and the faster you save them, the more points you earned, and levels were globally ranked. The game got decent reviews, mostly for its unique gameplay and cheap price at only $10. To promote the game, a web-based Flash game was produced called The Last Guy Everywhere with similar gameplay to its PS3 counterpart, but with a unique twist. Instead of playing on satellite renders of cities, the player has to rescue citizens off of websites. You enter a website into the game, and it generates a map turning aspects of the site into buildings and mazes populated with citizens for you to save. Obviously, because the game was made in 2008, some sites didn't work with the game, but it was a really interesting twist on an already unique game. And The Last Guy Everywhere was a hit. It even won a few awards like the Yahoo Japan Internet Creative Award in 2009. Based on the archives from the Wayback Machine, the site lastguy.jp was online from August 2008 to February 2010. We have some images from the game and a few gameplay videos, but the game files have not been recovered. Catholic PSAs the World Meeting of Families is a gathering of the Roman Catholic Church that started in 1994, boasted as the biggest gathering of Catholic families in the world. The event is held every three years, each time in a different country. According to the event organizers, the meeting promotes the pastoral care of families, protects their rights and dignity in the church and in civil society, so that they may ever be more able to fulfill their duties. The fourth meeting was held from January 22nd to the 26th in 2003 in the Philippines. Pope John Paul II was scheduled to be there, but canceled due to the progression of his Parkinson's disease. And if you are familiar with commercials in the Philippines, they are infamous for being unnecessarily creepy, and many of them are lost. So to promote the fourth world meeting of families in 2003, the advertisers knew exactly what they had to do. Tales of these lost commercials come from the Spooky Advertisement Group on Facebook, where a member posted about a series of TV and radio commercials they remember promoting the event. OP recalls four commercials. 
It starts with the sound of footsteps. A male voiceover says, This is the sound of the steps of shoes made of Italian leather. Followed by a mother crying after being slapped with a shoe, with a male voiceover saying, This is the sound of your mother, who was a victim of domestic violence. Another commercial from the World Meeting of Families had a child singing Frere Jaca. Then after a while, she suddenly cried while singing about her family, who begs for food, suggesting that the parents of the child either abandoned them or were separated from him. In another variant, a child and a woman is repeatedly being whipped by a belt as the child says, stop it. And the final commercial might be the worst. It starts with a dark background with a humming generator noise. A white text talks about the heating point of iron. The text disappears to show how long iron is heated to a certain temperature. Text disappears again, but shows something not related to iron's scientific properties. The text and humming noise abruptly disappears as something is hit and someone screaming in pain. At the end of the scream, a new text appears and a creepy music box plays. Text keeps changing until the end of the PSA and the logo appears at the end of the tune of the music box. Some of these commercials don't seem to exactly make sense, but this is also a translation and OP might just be confusing some of the details. Now this is just one person's recollection of the commercials, but in the comments many others recalled seeing the exact same thing. None of the ads have ever been found. Bye bye belly button. In June 2001, Levi's aired their famous belly button commercial for their new super low jeans. The commercial shows women's belly buttons edited to lip sync the lyrics to Diana Ross's classic I'm Coming Out, covered by Jamie Lynn Sigler. For me, this is one of the most memorable commercials. It had that perfect blend of a catchy song, a concept that was so odd it demanded your attention, and it was pretty annoying, which it seems like all memorable commercials have to be. Levi's knew they had a hit on their hands, and the commercial aired for months, but in November 2021, they decided it was time to move on, and made another commercial to mark the end of the I'm Coming Out era. On November 26th, 2011, during the TV special, the WB presents Teen People's What's Next, a concert showcasing Teen People magazine's picks for the next generation of musicians and artists. Levi's debuted its follow-up to I'm Coming Out, called Bye Bye Belly Button, to signal their new line of jeans, the super low stretch. But it appears that this commercial only aired one single time at 2138 Eastern Time as a special event. Because we know exactly when it aired, what channel it was on, and what show was being played, it shouldn't be too hard to track down this commercial. But every upload we can find of the WB special has the commercials edited out. If we can find an upload with the commercials still intact, we should be able to find this follow-up to one of the most memorable commercials of all time. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform empowering you to create your own website and launch your dream projects. Squarespace's most impressive feature is its fluid engine. Using a simple drag and drop system, it makes creating a website fun and effortless. You could really just get lost messing around with everything. Even their fantastic selection of professional website templates are versatile and easy to use, providing a solid foundation for a great website, but never limiting you creatively, ensuring that your vision for the perfect website is never compromised. This could really be said about everything Squarespace has to offer. Storage is made simple with their new asset library, and setting up an online store could not be easier. If you're selling merch, Squarespace will take care of the production, inventory, and shipping for you. I could go on, but you should just go check it out for yourself. Head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your dream website or domain, go to squarespace.com slash allthingslost to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, that's squarespace.com slash allthingslost. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any suggestions for future videos, or any lost commercials that I missed in this video, let me know in the comments. And a big shout out to my top tier Patreon supporters. Can you say Rogue Goat Mafleur, Miss Dana, Vinny Cataldo, and Abdesta Honeycrisp. Thank you. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.